thank you to be here. Um, today I'm going to present uh, a paper that is part of this uh, compilation, uh, this present for science advances. This is a compilation of 20, 21 uh, papers of science advances and science theme thesis uh, with, the, with the BICCN consortium. And for this one, uh, they present, uh, it's more focused uh, in the, right? in a comparative atlas of single cell chromatin accessibility in the human brain. Um, I'm going to start giving a, a short introduction of what is talking this paper. Uh, they uh, are using um, single cell, single nuclei ataxic analysis, where autos explore uh, open chromatin landscapes across 1.1 million cells in 42 brain regions that we can see here. Uh, these regions are, uh, let's say, are different uh, subsets for different regions. For example, here we have uh, seven regions for the bas basal nuclei, 22 for the cortex. Uh, we have two for the thalamus, three for the hippocampus, two for the cerebellus, one for the bones, and one for the brain, and four for the amygdala. Uh, with this data, they uh, would classify uh, 107 distinct cell types that we can see uh, part of this here, and they uh, spe they could uh, specify um, they the in their specific utilization of five uh, five hundred forty four thousand uh, candidate cis regulatory elements DNA elements in the human genome. Uh, also, uh, the authors uh, could uh, validate that nearly one third of these uh, candidate cis regulatory elements. Uh, demonstrate conservation in chromatin accessibility in the in the mouse brain cells. So this is another highlight that they that they show. And also, uh, they couldn't extend to make a, a let's say a a deep learning model, a le learning machine model, when they could predict uh, this is relevant to cell types for nineteen neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, strong links between specific brain cells and also neuropsychiatric disorders include schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, Alzheimer, and major depression. Uh, also, the the this the, the deep learning machine model to predict the regulatory roles of not coding risk variants of these disorders. Uh, it's available in an interactive web atlas that uh, can be accessed uh, with this link. Okay. So uh, I will focus on the main things catch my attention because are more related with my with my work. So uh, this is uh, related to the figure one when they uh, show the single cell analysis of the chromatin accessibility. So as we as I explained, these are the regions. Uh, so the first round consists in classify or in clustering three major classes. And these three major classes are present here in the panel B, D, and F, and correspond to the class one is uh, for glutamatic uh, neurons that are around 11 percentage. And the second one is for, it's a, a class enriched for gabaric neurons that is around 6.8 percentage. And the last one that is the class three is enriched for non neuronal cells that it's most of the, it's close to the 81, 82 percentage of the, of the cells. Um, once they made this major classification, next step consists in recluster uh, in subclasses, each one of these, of these three major classes. So we can see here that, for example, for the, the third class, they made 14 subclasses that are, um, of B glutamate uh, neurons, uh, granule cell types, um, collideric neurons, and subclasses of dopa dopaminergic neurons, plus thalamic and midbrain derived neurons. They did correspond to this one, and they do the same with the other classes. Uh, 11 for the gabaric neurons, and eight subclasses for non neuron classes, for non neuron cells, sorry. So we can see here that they advance in the analysis doing this uh, second route of iterative clustering. And one question that I was curious to know is how they made the annotation 
with this data. So to do the notation, they take uh, each, each one of these subclasses that we can see here in each of the three major classes was annotated matching at least three marker genes of no brain cells types together uh, with the brain region where the cell reside. So this was, let's say, the 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 uh, the, strategy, the strategy that was used to make this the the major annotation and the classes annotations. So this takes me to to keep an eye to the how they filter the data before to do all this classification and to run the cluster in the in the subpopulations. So one thing or aspect that take my attention is that well they use the let's say the the classic um plots that are used to to confer data reliability in chromatin accessibility regions that is driven for the nucleoson signal and for the transcription stat sites uh, plot. Even when we have here a uh, slight difference, uh, this indeed is the same kind of information that is uh, involved in the plots. For example, here in the, in the panel E, we see that uh, they, uh, part of the reliability was uh, guided to see that they have a chromatin structure um, defined. So this is as typically we see in this kind of plots. Also, they could see that the transcription starts in start size enrichment uh, for the data that they, that they are driving here. It's around, let's say, seven. That is, let's say, the acceptable. Uh, transcription start size for these kind of experiments. Uh, but also the ideal is around a, a uh, around this one. So this is, uh, let's say, a uh, classical threshold that I can see in this kind of experiments. Uh, but also I, I keep an eye to see how they made the filtering based in other parameters or other S-core signatures. So I have seen uh, that uh, more common now than before in, in other articles that um, they make a removal of doublets. And in other articles, I see that even in this kind of experiment, they remove RNA ambient with different tools. But for them, uh, they removed around, um, let's say, 100,000 uh, single nucleate attack profiles. They resolve with potential. Uh, bar collision or doublets. So in this panel E, this is, uh, let's say, the, the fraction of potential barcode collision detected in each one of the donors that we have here described, donor one, donor two, and donor three. So they do this using um, a modified version of a scroblet that is a uh, package for Python. And so here in the, in the panel G, it's like, the, it's like uh, a bar, a bar plot that is showing the, the fraction of usable uh, uh, attack profiles. And in light blue is the noisy, the noisy profiles, and the 6.5 percentage correspond to the that was removed. So I think that this is something that is interesting for me. Um, also, uh, this, uh, when they run a scoreboard on these individual samples for accurate double detection, well, uh, this is to ensure, so the purpose of this is to ensure that the, the threshold effectively separates the peaks uh, from the, let's say, the theoretical cube that we are expecting to see for this kind of profiles. And if the doublet don't cluster together after to, to, do, to do this uh, analysis, uh, this means that they have a tweak of the threshold and the preprocessing parameters. So uh, walking through this, um, a total of more than one million nuclei were retained at the end. And well, uh, I could see that there are other doublet detection tools or options like doublet finder, doublet decon, uh, at least for R. And, and another one, the doublet detection bodies for Python. So these are like alternatives. Uh, this, other, this other plot, uh, catch my attention because it involves a lot of information. So it's composite for 
a hierarchical clustering of the 42 subpopulations detected in the three major classification clusters, the discomposer for the glutamatic uh, major class, the gabaitic uh, second major class, and the third one is the non-neuron class. This is the number of nuclei composer for each one of the subpopulations. Here is the contribution of the donors. As we can see, he labeled with different colors in this, in this panel, E. And here are the tracks of the accessibility uh, for each one of the marker genes that were used to the, make the annotation. So it's interesting to see that, for example, for the glutamate uh, major classification, we can see that there is some kind of heterogen heterogeneity in the marker genes used, that, for example, is not present in the GABAERIC major classification or in the neurons ones. Uh, so, and this is, it, this can be like see through most of these uh, annotations uh, with the marker genes used. Uh, another important thing of these um, complex plots, if it here in the, in the panel G, we can see uh, two other additional columns. The, this one is to highlight what is the region that corresponds to this one of the subpopulations. So we can see here that, for example, if we see in the middle, here is a, a more remarkable difference uh, regarding the, for example, glutamatic uh, regions that have major targets, uh, as well as these kind of populations. But for example, um, we, we have also specific subpopulations where we can see that there are very specific for some regions. And we can confirm this in this uh, column when we can see that uh, as greater the bar is my is greater the specificity for this specific region. So I think that is very important because not only give context about of the of the um, let's say the annotation indeed for each one of these population, but also tell tell us something about the specificity. And these are only uh, some three samples that I uh, retrieved from the article to say that, for example, in cases where they see uh, like uh, some kind of different kind of peaks reflected for one specific marker genes, they uh, subcluster these and give um, retrieving or making it more refined subpopulations. And also, well, they, they could highlight that, for example, most neuronal cell types and some glial cell types were distributed in the, in the human brain in not uniform fashion. So this is related to the panel G, the information that I explained a minute before. And also, this is an, a very example, this is a very good example that, for example, in the subpopulation ACDGM, that is, I think, here, we can see the, the the major specificity that have for these particular regions. But indeed, this is full of information. Uh, so this takes me, let's say, to think a bit of how was do the peak calling that comes from the previous, uh, let's say, plot, and how was the filtering pipeline refined to do this all this analysis? So let's say that in general, to recapitulate, uh, once that they identify the open chromatin regions and classify in 107 brain cell types, they make an aggregate uh, of the chromatin accessibility profiles that we can see, let's say, reflected here in the panel A, and identify these regions using MAX2. For the filtering and, and resulting chromatin accessibility, uh, we're based that it needs to be present in at least two donors or in the pseudo ball replicates. So it was the main filter used to, let's say, uh, keep the most uh, relevant uh, peak calling in the, day, in the attack profiles. So uh, also they use, uh, this, uh, this is the, the row peaks and after, after the, overlap, the, the native overlap, they also use here, um, where I show into plots when they use uh, normalized uh, attack profiles using scores per millions to correct the bias. 
And this is the final uh, CIS, uh, candidate central regulatory elements kit in the in the in this uh, analysis. One thing that called a lot of my attention is that they say that according with previous results, they can notice that about thousand nuclei indeed are sufficient to identify over 80% of the accessible regions in cell types. And this is consistent with previous findings. So it appears that we don't need a, a very high number of attack profiles to identify at least this 80% of accessibility regions. Next, I have this uh, figure two. And this figure two was to make identification and the characterization of these uh, candidate cis regulatory elements across human brain. So just uh, let's say that these uh, candidate regulatory elements together makes up to the close night percentage of the human genome, and this is the distribution. So we can see that they rely in very different kind of genomic, genomic um, let's say features that includes uh, all kind of uh, this, uh, this kind of genomic regions that you can see in terms of uh, intergenic regions, uh, promoters, and, and all this kind of even non-coding regions. So there is a lot of proportion of these, but we can see the most relevant that are in the intergenic and the interregions. Also, uh, of these, at least 90 percentage were located, at least, and I, I see very important this data, in two cabals away from the annotated promoter region uh, of protein codings and, and long, long non-coding regions of RNA uh, genes. So I think that this, this looks pretty nice because Part of the reliability that they show here, for example, together with the panel B, is that this uh, big percentage of candidate cis regulatory element five are in proximal regions, as we can see here. Uh, these are the distal regions that we can see here uh, below the, the proximal. And in the gray line, we can see that this is the random one. So uh, next, uh, well, they, argue that several that they have several lines of evidence to support the, the authenticity of these identified candidacy regulatory element that includes uh, the proximal, the distal region, and the difference with the distant regions and the conservation in the random genomic regions that is similar to GC content. And next, when they plotted the medial genes, I'm oh, sorry, of the uh, median level of chromatin accessibility uh, against the maximum variation of each element. And to characterize the cell type specificity, uh, they uh, use a non-negative uh, metric factorization and to, let's say, uh, to classify into, into 30, 37 modules that we can see here and with elements in each module sharing the cell specificity profile, and they refer here to the regions too. So they want to highlight, and we can see here, um, let's say uh, in this line, the discourse here in the diagonal, uh, a very specificity in the modules, except for the module one, that is that it refers to a very, uh, let's say, uh, quite present into all the regions, meaning that they are ubiquitous uh, regulatory elements that are everywhere, uh, classified from everywhere in the, in the analysis. Uh, so next thing that catch my attention is that well, uh, they, uh, this, they present in this same figure too, and a schematic of the strategy you set for uh, for identify these cis regulatory elements that are positively correlated with transcription of target genes. So, uh, as this is a, a, a epigenetic uh, analysis, they crowd information with single, with single cell uh, information. And the analysis reveal, like we can see here, uh, that 
a large group of more than 5,000 putative nature that were linked to 4,000 genes, more strongly expressed in the neuronal cell clusters than either in the non-neuronal cell clusters that we could see here. Uh, sorry, in the module one. Um, this is not, uh, let's, this is, uh, let's say, uh, in a strategy that, that they need to follow because as this is not, uh, let's say, um, they don't have the linkage between the attack profiles with the single cell analysis. They have, they, they have to do it manually, uh, following a certain kind of strategy to 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 cause the linkage. So I don't dip too much into what are the methods indeed used to do it, but they can linkage the information between the two the two data sets, two different data sets. Uh, then I I keep an eye into the regional specificity of the of glia and neuronal cell C circulatory elements and just to to focus that uh, in these U maps that we can see here from from the layer A to the layer M, um, these embeddings in the in the very regional spaces show a gradient that we can see here in each one of these among cells that includes uh, all the subpopulations of the non-organal uh, populations. So they say that, uh, or hypothesize that these gradients that we can see here in each one of these, of these populations uh, may reflect heterogeneity in, in candidacy regulatory element usage uh, in these glia cells across brain regions, but they also highlight that there is a lot of variable cis regulatory elements across these regions, as we can see here in the panel C, G, K, and O. So if we can see here in the line, uh, all these cross uh, the, let's say, uh, with a high variability target. Uh, and then uh, they highlight that around 50,000 Variable C regulatory element may around, for example, full percentage of the total C regulatory elements in the OGC uh, subpopulation. And they highlight a lot of statistics, statistics derived from this analysis that, come, that are related to the non neuronal uh, major class. Uh, so I highlight this because I'm trying to dig in the methods that we can like uh, apply or extend to a multi-mode multi analysis, for instance. So uh, I don't dig too much in how they made the, let's say the relation between, to calculate the one third percentage that is presented or conservative in the mouse species, and either how they cross uh, the information to these specific uh, brain disorders. But uh, there is a lot of information that I think that is important to check in this article. So as conclusion, uh, uh, using this strategy, they could identify these 107 distinct brain cell types, also to identify the 5,000, 5, 100,000 transcriptional regulatory elements of these cell types and also identify the conservation, as I said, in the mouse brain, and, the, and they could predict uh, what is, what of these in 19, what of these regulatory elements play a role in 19 neuropsychiatric trait disorders. Also, if you keep an eye to this, um, let's say, um, distribution of this uh, release of CATLAS, that is the developed machine learning model that forecasts or predicts these regulatory functions of this disease risk variants. Uh, what is important here is that it includes these non-coding uh, particular regions that are not, let's say, uh, there is a lot to study yet in, in this kind of elements. And that's all I have, guys. Thank you. And